What was, <laughs> what was it like seeing it again? Because you've, you've only seen it at home. You haven't seen it in a, with the crowd. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's, and there's more to my life than what was on this film, believe me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is sort of one of the interesting things that I've sort of had to try to figure out because each of these guys that I'm interviewing has, you know, a minimum of 70, 72 years of life experience. And generally, the interviews are about an hour long, completed or less. And uh, so part of what I've had to try to figure out is what's the, what's the, in the narrative storyline that this project is about. And it's really about, uh, I, I said to one of the guys, I said, you know, it's about what happened when you first realized that your boner was pointed in the wrong direction <laughs> and how you evolved. So it really does, it's become more focused since I did this one with you, but it's really the idea is to really focus on the journey of realizing that one is gay, starting often at a time when people didn't even know that other gay people existed. So yeah, I left out a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, as I said in the film, I figured out very early on there were, there were other gay people even back in in Iowa, in the middle of the country, on farmland. So. Yeah, and you never got arrested or anything like that. Nope. And, um, uh, and as none, actually only one. Probably, of should <laughs> Probably should have been. Probably should have been. Alex, um, do you remember when I first called you to work on this? No. Good, bring, bring in the. Uh, I was younger. I'm. I'm going to be 27 in like a month. I think I was, it was 24. So. Yeah, you were 24 when you started. Yeah. Alex is someone who, I guess you had contacted me uh, after I had made We Were Here. You posted something about the movie, and we sort of became yeah. Facebook friends. Mm -hmm. And then we met at Frameline. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, when, uh, when the idea came up to work with younger gay men as editors, Alex was one of the first people I thought of. Also, Ben Zweig, who's back here, uh, is one of the editors on this project. And... Um, was someone who I called immediately to participate in this. Yeah. Alex will probably need lifetime psychotherapy after. <laughs> no, I needed after this when that. I was, I needed this much younger and I would have been a lot less. Uh, <laughs> Alex, can, can you talk a little bit about what your journey has been with this? Yeah, so, uh, I don't even know. Like, I think the first footage I saw of this project was Jack, actually, because I'm not sure if you'd even, Maybe you had already filmed this? We weren't even sure what, I, what we were going to do with me. You were just talking about the project. And when I first saw that footage, it was so fascinating because you were talking about stuff that I had always had questions about, but I would never talked about it with older gay guys. So I didn't even know of you or anything yet. And then when you finally showed me his footage, I was like, oh, I have to do this because First off, I'm also from a farm town in Indiana, and so it was really fascinating to think about how similar our upbringings or our experiences were, even though completely different generations. Uh, I didn't have glory holes, but I had, you know, <laughs> like I, I think my version of like the little magazines was like the pictures of underwear at the like the like a Walmart or something. I was like, oh, I remember like sneaking glances when I was like with friends, and they were like actually shopping for underwear, and I was like. Looking at bulges. So that would have been pre-internet, also. No, not yeah, really. Yeah, I, I didn't have pre. I didn't have internet when I was a kid. Yeah. I didn't have internet until. I think high school, like at my house, maybe middle school. So my first experiences were also publications that weren't even like sexual. But so it, it was just interesting to relate so much to your experiences without really having a similar lifestyle at all. Like I didn't go in the military or anything, so. Yeah, actually, the internet didn't come around until about 92. And it's hard now to visualize. That didn't seem that far away. But uh, we haven't had the internet that long. Well, and I even back then, happened. it was so limited in what it well, gave yeah. us access to. Uh, yeah, it's kind of mind boggling. Um, one of the things that uh, in working, the way I've worked with the editors is that um, generally, we start off working like two or three days together and we'll look at the material together and talk about the content and also talk about the style of, of storytelling. And then Alex lives in LA, so I guess first time we met was I, I, I was in LA, right? Or mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And then 
uh, the editors will work, and then they'll post an edit on Vimeo, and I'll give notes, and then we'll go back and forth a few times, and then we get together a couple more times over the process. But one of the things that I encouraged Alex to do in the cutting of this was to get together with friends his own age and watch the work in progress. And can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Yeah. Um, it actually, the people I showed it to, I didn't even really, a couple were people I knew well, and then the other two, I kind of showed it to like four. It was half and half, people I knew and people I didn't really know. And it was interesting because in all of the screenings, uh, it was just a really organic atmosphere for just talking about stuff we never talk about. like our first experiences of being gay, like when did you know and all that stuff. And it was kind of funny, it was like things I was like, oh, I hadn't even thought to talk about that really. But then to hear your life, it was even more interesting because you were touching on stuff that we didn't even think about as being like hurdles you had to go over. We're like, oh, I didn't even think that that would be a problem or, or like a, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it just opened up a whole, and I also found out some friends were way more interested in this stuff as well. I didn't feel like such a, weirdo who was also like kind of insecure about talking to older guys. So I, those were kind of, no offense, but like some of my favorite parts of this project were kind of interacting with people my age because it was kind of unifying in a cool way and it wouldn't have happened if you guys hadn't talked. So. Um, let's open it up to questions because, yeah. <laughs> oh, there was more. The question is about uh, what Bob feels has been the most sort of profound aspect of his life in a relationship to being a political activist. Well, uh, going back to uh, uh, towards the end of the film, I pointed out, you know, we've got a lot of problems still that we have to face. And uh, we have a lot of organizations out there that are working to help us do this. So we've got... Uh, uh, well, one of my favorites is Frameline, uh, the film festival. We've got uh, Horizons. Uh, we've got uh, Lambda Legal. We've got NCLR. Uh, the list goes on and on uh, of all the gay organizations we have out there that need our help. And uh, I, I've done what I can, <laughs> uh, but we need a lot more people working with them. We've got uh, open house. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, uh, the LGBT uh, or the Gay uh, Historical Society. We've got the James Hormel Center, which is part of where we are tonight. Uh, all of these organizations need additional funding. Uh, and I, I would hope that we can continue to support them and, and do our part. And I know a, a number of the organizations are represented here tonight, and thank you very much for being here. One of the things that's so s sort of striking seeing this now is that obviously this was filmed before the election, and the idea that things would change to the extent that they have never occurred to us. I mean, it, you know, who, who could have imagined where we'd be right now? And you, you, in a sense, you know, are admonishing people not to think we've won all of the victories. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's a totally different reality right. that we're facing now. Well, I mean, even when we were cutting this, I remember it was kind of, we were on, it felt like an upswing because I think marriage equality had just passed and we were watching the footage of being like, oh, okay, Bob, like, calm down. Like, it's like, it's good. And it's so crazy how, it, yeah, it's like, it's pretty nuts that, uh, you're very, it, that, that piece is the biggest, takeaway to this project I think is the long view because there are times where things get uh, very overwhelming I feel um, with the state of things and 
to see what you went through and what all the other guys went through that you've talked to so far. I feel like there are times now where I'm like, okay, we can get through this shitstorm because you guys have been through worse, I would, I would say, but maybe not, who knows? It feels like every day there's another disaster, but um, there's been many times in the back of my mind when I'm with friends and when I'm with people where I'm just like, I feel like there's no optimism and hope left, and then I'm just like, I hear your voice where like, just be vigilant and mm. kind of kick it into gear, and it's really great. It's like, it's a, something that has changed me through this proce process, which is great. Yeah, and I forgot to mention the Transgender Law Center. That's another one we need to <laughs> really, really support. Um, well, the first time that these two met, uh, we were just about done with the editing on the piece. It wasn't completely done, but we were showing excerpts at the Castro, and I wanted Bob to see the full edit, and Alex was up here for those screenings, and so Alex and I went over to Bob's, and that was the first time that the two of them met, and both were, <laughs> both were very excited about meeting each other. And, um, but it was, uh, it was a, there was a very profound moment that happened. I'm, I, you're not going to cry this time, because it's far <laughs> enough since it happened, but um, Alex, it was right after Orlando, and uh, Alex respond, got very emotional in the room with the two of us and talked about how Really, for him, it was the first time of feeling really, really vulnerable as a gay person and in such a shocking way. And again, that how getting to know Bob through the process of working on this had really been a kind of a way of um, uh, helping him maneuver through the, the shock of Orlando. So that was a very powerful moment. I mean, speaking for myself, I mean, uh, I, this project is different for me in that in, in the other films that I've made, really, they aren't they don't have any value until they're in front of an audience at a film festival or going on TV. And I've really tried to approach this project where every aspect of it has its own inherent value. So the, the shoot uh, has its own inherent value. And part of what I hope to do for the uh, people who I'm interviewing is to give them an experience of feeling witnessed and valued and seen at a time of life in which many older people, old gay people or otherwise, feel invisible. And so that's one aspect of it. Uh, I want the people on the crew to have an experience that's a rich one. I want the experience for the editors to be rich. So each, each, uh, each aspect of the project for me has its own inherent value. So I'm not so focused on the result in a, in a way that one normally is when making a film. Um, I don't remember where I was going with that. Any, any other uh, questions? Yes. I have a sort of a technical question about the production of the film. Uh, how much film did you shoot to get the 48 minutes, to edit down to 48 minutes? And the reason I'm asking that is it seems that the film seems to be very cohesive. Like, it doesn't seem to jump around as if there's obvious cuts. So can you say, uh, comment a little bit about how much film you actually shot and how you made it so sort I of I would flow guess it's so about, well? yeah. uh, probably about <laughs> Three hours max total material that gets cut down. And I mean, that's where the editing comes in. I mean, I, when I started doing this, I thought, what are people going to think? Because I mean, it's gonna, it, is it going to just look like a talk show? And uh, will people make that assumption? But they're very intentionally edited. And um, so thank you for, it, for saying that it seems smooth. Um, but there is, that's what Alex and I do uh, in the process of editing these things, is to try to create a narrative that keeps your attention. I mean, part of it is, I mean, in terms of, the, of what Bob raised about, uh, he's done a lot more in his 77 years of life than what's in here, is that I also am very aware that nobody's gonna watch a seven hour long piece on Bob Dockendorf. I would, but I don't know that, it, that everybody else would. And so I have to be cognizant of what's the, how, how long can these be? And Ben, uh, one of my editors in the back, Ben, raise your hand another one of my wonderful editors. Um, ben and I had a, a number of conversations about length and, uh, you know, how, well, about the length of the piece. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and, um, and I think what I said was, I want them to be as long as they can because the, ma the material is important. And I'm not as worried about whether or not someone will watch the whole thing at one sitting or, or whatever, but, it, but given that these are stories from a generation whose stories are different than anyone that follows, 
the pre-Stonewall generation. I want to have as much information in there as possible so that they are of value uh, for posterity and going forward. So it's a, real, it's a different way of working. And um, so as long as they can, but also short enough so that they ideally can maintain enough momentum and engagement so that people do watch them all the way through as much as possible in one sitting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the whole idea of these is that they are as available as possible to as many people as possible. And how exactly that's going to play out, I don't know. I mean, even this is something that I hadn't really anticipated. Everything about the project has sort of evolved in a very organic way. Um, I didn't know that I was going to be doing public screenings of these. Uh, I, I've sort of very much avoided thinking about that because I wanted to do the work just on its own terms. Um, but yes, I mean, ideally, uh, these will be available for free to as many people uh, as possibly can see them. Um, yeah, it, it's all, the project has changed quite a bit for me since the election. Uh, I, I probably will not make any more than I've made, which was not originally what my thought was, is that I would do them uh, for a long time. Yes, Bruce. Is there a mic? Uh, Thank you. So over the years, we've had uh, representation in San Francisco city government uh, by different gay people, uh, starting with Harvey Milk and you know lots of lesbians and different people. But we've never had a, <laughs> you know, lots of wonderful folks from our community. But across the country, we've had gay mayors or lesbian mayors. Uh, this city has not had one yet. Uh, here's three different age groups. Does our city need one? Uh, the, the two different parties have ran both queer candidates and non-queer candidates. Jane Kim, uh, I, like, for, like for gay, that, like a gay mayor. Yeah, I think we've got potentially the next mayor of San Francisco sitting right here in the audience tonight, <laughs> Mark Leno. <laughs> Was that a trick? Was that a trick question, Bruce Bodet? <laughs> I know you. <laughs> yes. So, a question for you about 1965. Uh, Cast your mind back to 1965 and tell us about the neighborhoods that were in San Francisco. I know that the waterfront had been a neighborhood in the early 60s with Jack's Waterfront and some of the bars there. Were the bars that you went to along Market Street or were they in the Tenderloin? Um, try, try Folsom. Folsom, okay, <laughs> so the Toolbox? Yeah. The yeah. Toolbox and? Toolbox, uh, Phoebe's, uh, the Covered Wagon. Covered Wagon, okay. Uh, actually, there was, I, I did hang out on uh, uh, Polk Street quite a little because uh, uh, the P.S. restaurant and uh, Cassidy Crystal, uh, Mexican restaurant, were all owned by a good by by Bob Trollope and Jay Levine, and 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 Bob Dameron. Uh, and of course, there was there was also the bar on um, uh, Sutter Street, r the Rendezvous, which was a bar that many people probably the older folks in here been in. Remember that one, it was a great, great bar. Uh, another one of Trollope's bars. Uh, since he bought me the drinks when I first got into town, most of them, <laughs> I, could, <laughs> I could have free drinks in. <laughs> um, I had a question, Bob. Uh, you know, you were sort of talked about uh, you know, the um, nonprofits and so on. But, you know, you also mentioned the thing of like, you know, people still get kicked out of their families and, and need uh, support. I mean, what do you, you know, what are your ideas in terms of, uh, you know, long-term sustainability of uh, the gay community? That's an interesting question. Uh, uh, again, the key word is community. Uh, uh, and uh, 
we have a number of organizations that will take care of uh, kids that are get kicked out. We've got the, uh, the, the LGBT Center, which does a lot of work in that area. Uh, we've got a number of other organizations right offhand. I, yes, uh, the Larkin Street, yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, at some point, we have to keep these organizations in place. We have to keep the community in place. Uh, we have to keep meeting face to face. The, I, I mean, the, the bars are going away, unfortunately, uh, only because they, not that I want to uh, push alcohol, but, but that they were a meeting place for folks. We, we need other institutions that will take the place of those for people to get face to face contact again. First of all, I loved it. Thank you all for doing it. It was just great. Thanks, Lex. Now, David, this is for you. How are you going to change your persona? You mentioned that you're going to, after seeing yourself on film, there were certain ways you were, I'm interested in you. Well, I'm blonde in all of the other ones. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, it's it's when you're when you're interviewing in a conventional documentary, uh, you you instruct the person to try to use the question in the answer, so that the the questioner is invisible. So this is completely different, and I think I was sort of fumbling my way a little bit through this one. Um, there's so many things to keep in the in one's mind in a situation like this. I have to be aware of. First of all, I have to listen really closely because I don't really know where the interview is going to go. So I'm, I'm being strategic, in a sense, in relationship to editing. Uh, I'm also being alert to when fatigue is going to set in, uh, because it does always, either for me or for the other person, and where are we in the story. Um, but one of the things that I remember being asked by some students once about um, uh, you know, just quest interviewing styles, and I said, well, it's always different, depending on who you're dealing with. But one of the things that I know is that uh, it's really important that the person who you're interviewing feels like that every word that's coming out of their mouth is fascinating to you. So one of the things that I noticed when I first saw myself on camera is that I was over-emoting. <laughs> um, because, you know, I'm kind of going, you know, and, uh, and so I toned, down, I toned down some of the emoting on camera because uh, it shows, you know, and uh, so things like that, but also, uh, yeah, it, w it was really interesting watching this one. Um, I mean, Bob, in a sense, was a, an early guinea pig on this project. But I feel like I've gotten better uh, at, at figuring out how I bring value added, the, the balance between being an interviewer, a co-conversationalist, and a storyteller on my own, ways in which I ask can ask questions or establish a tone that will uh, that the audience will pick up on in terms of camaraderie or intimacy. Um, so there's all kinds of different pieces. So there's all of this is going on in my mind while I'm also trying to be a really, really attentive listener. So it's been a learning process for me. Um, and they're all really different. I mean, if, uh, I hope that a lot of you can come to the other two that I'm showing here, because they're quite, each of them are quite different. The, the, uh, the one that I'm showing at the Jewish, uh, Contemporary Jewish Museum, I'm not on screen. It was the first one that I did and it's with Jack Lasner, and it's quite different stylistically, but he's a pip, he's a, quite a, uh, a character. Yes? Well, I have a comment or question for each of you, so um, I'll be quick. Um, first of all, uh, David, I, I think that you are a great interviewer uh, in this, and I really enjoyed it. Plus, I don't know if you had braces or not, but you have beautifully straight teeth. <laughs> I take uh, them out every night, but they're... <laughs> oh, well they, look, well, they look great while you're wearing them. So anyway, I think that you're a great interview, and it seemed very natural, and I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Um, Bob, I wanted to ask you about the Cable Car Club, or whatever that was, that... Cable Car the, Awards. The Cable Car Awards. Yes. Um, and also to ask you if the um, organizations that you th are identifying as need support, if they need more than just money for those of us who are not endowed with capital, um, 
after the election, I actually did some outreach to a couple of organizations that I wanted to connect with and did not get responses to my desire to volunteer. And then lastly for Al Alex? Alex. Yeah, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the things that you observed in the footage that you and maybe your friends didn't realize were barriers for gay men from the earlier generations. So thanks. Okay, cable car awards? Uh, Cable car. Um, that's that. That was a um, really a big event in San Francisco for many many years, where uh, uh, Bob Kramer started it, and uh, uh, Bob was a wonderful person, very outgoing. Uh, what we did, we recognized outstanding uh, people, bars, events. Uh, everything in the gay community had it, fell into a category. And uh, uh, we awarded those, gave nice, nice plaques and awards to all the, the winners of the various, that represented the various uh, organizations and uh, uh, groups. It was, uh, I really hated to see it go, but again, uh, the internet, things like that, uh, wore it down eventually. Um, as far as volunteering, a lot of organizations need volunteers. It's too bad that you've had some bad experience there, but uh, uh, there's, um, I'm trying to think of who lists all of the gay organizations that, uh, there's several places. Uh, you might start by calling Horizons Foundation and ask them if they know of organizations that are currently looking for volunteers because there is a lot of need for volunteer work. Uh, open house might be another one to, to contact. Uh, sometimes it's just persistence too, because sometimes the volunteers are answering the phones. So, uh, you know, just persistence sometimes helps. Huh. Alex, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I think the. the <laughs> I know I hate being hussy. Uh, I think one of the biggest barriers, which is actually the least touched upon, is the 80s and AIDS and that because it's so uh it's so hard to kind of grasp and so but like i personally you know i kind of want to know more about it or know like firsthand like, like like what it was like and so that's who wants to talk about that in you know just kind of randomly so the way you guys kind of handled that was interesting because you both had history with it and lost people and it I don't I, that didn't really answer the question but it was just interesting because I think sometimes it might be just okay to ask about that even though it is a touchy thing um, because I just feel like if we can understand sort of our experiences we can Actually, you could make more friends that, that are a little bit younger, because you mentioned that, and that always broke my heart, that line where you were like, you know, the older, the older you get, the harder it is to make friends, and I feel like a lot of that is us just not wanting to make the other one uncomfortable or not waste the time, or I don't know. Um, but you were pretty open. I mean, I actually did enjoy, I know it's like your least favorite part, but I also really liked hearing about the sex stuff, because it's like, I am curious, like, what... <laughs> what were you doing? Like, it's just like, because there's so much, there's so many things in your way, like how it, and it's actually crazy, you were a lot more adventurous than I am, so, and you had a lot. All of the editors things. said that about the people that they were editing. That, uh, <laughs> and I know that some of the editors have had new experiences that they hadn't had before. <laughs> some degree inspired by these wonderful gentlemen. One of the things that I experienced in the making of we were here in talking to older people and talking to younger people was that I kept on hearing from younger people that they had lots of questions, but they either didn't know how to phrase them or didn't know if they were uh, appropriate questions to ask. And because I have Holocaust history in my family, that really resonated for me, the idea that I is it okay to ask a question or is it gonna to cause too much pain for people? And at the same time, older people didn't wanna talk about things because they felt like nobody wants to hear and 
uh, it's depressing and I sound like I'm living in the past. So there's this, there's this ridiculous gap. And one of the things that I said to some of my younger friends in, and continue to in relationship to this is um, you can always ask someone, you can say, I, there's questions that I'd be interested in asking you about your past. Are you open to having a conversation with me? No one ever, ever, ever objects to being asked that. And people can set their own boundaries. But I think that the, that the hesitance to express our curiosity, whatever vantage point we're coming from, whatever age we're coming from, is that we're all doing a disservice to ourselves and each other by not engaging in conversations because we don't know quite how to have them. So um, it's part of why I was so glad that Alex was having these conversations with peers in the process of, of uh, editing this piece. I actually would like to open this up to two other people who are here. Um, Loretta Molitor was a sound person on this shoot, and Chris Tipton King was a camera assistant on this. If, if either of you want to uh, say anything about what you experience, I'm in no obligation, but if there's anything that either of you would like to say about being Chris, do you want to? You don't have to. It's OK. Chris has just made a wonderful uh, uh, YouTube series about prep. Um, you just, I have a lot of probably the same. You know, Alex and I have never met, but we kind of met indirectly because he's editing the footage that I shot. Uh, but it was, it was interesting for me to hear about you know, what sex was like before Grindr. Because um, you know, I, I have those questions, too. And it's not something you just. Uh, there's there's not a lot of spaces in which generations come into contact. Um, you know, the, I think a lot of my generation's knee-jerk reaction, which I'm now seeing is totally inappropriate, to older persons approaching us is they thinking they want something sexual out of us and then being grossed out by it. Um, and there's not a lot in, in gay community. There's not a lot of spaces where there is intergenerational contact that. You know, everything in gay culture is loaded with sex. <laughs> and so it would be nice if there were spaces like this one uh, where we could have these conversations without them being loaded with other, you know, loaded down with other expectations. So I'm, uh, I'm grateful for David for, uh, for facilitating this, and I wish that there was more of it. Um, Do you remember what you were feeling or thinking while you were sitting by the camera listening to all of this stuff? I mean, was it, was it, a, con was it a kind of uh, environment and information that you had not really been in a position to engage with before? You know, what was, what was surprising to me actually was, you know, I anticipated uh, gay elder stories. A lot of what you do here, because I, I had seen your other film, and if you guys have not seen David's other film, we were here, it is, uh, it was, it's an eye-opening uh, piece about the AIDS crisis, and it answers a lot of the questions that Alex was bringing up. Um, but I expected to hear about how terrible being gay was <laughs> in that time, uh, like how you know how much facing discrimination and being raided by the police and, and on and on and on. And actually, he had a lot of like great upbeat stories about how wonderful it was. You know, even though it was underground, he had to maintain this double life. But uh, there was also a lot of joy in his experience, and that was not something that I expected, uh, and I thought was refreshing to hear. And just letting you know that you're sitting next to a movie star, Paul Chin, who's one of my other elders who I've interviewed. And <laughs> Can't wait to see it. <laughs> Hi, Paul. I shot Paul, remember? Oh, that's right. Of course you shot Paul. I was there. <laughs> this is part of what happens as you get older. You start to forget things. Loretta, did you have any thoughts from having been there at the, at the shoot? Uh, over there. Loretta did all of the audio on We Were Here also, and also has worked with me on films going way, way, way back. Uh, and as, as part of We Were Here, that was such an intense experience for me because, uh, and it was cathartic and healing going, and it was, but it was so intense around AIDS and all that went with it. Um, this was refreshing to have another three-dimensional uh, story and I always have to check my own internal questions as we go along <laughs> but uh, no it was refreshing and uh, and I enjoyed it and I've I was able to do um, I also did coming out under fire where we in Arthur Dong interviewed uh, we interviewed World War two vets um, so it's interesting to get the breadth you know in that window of time I hadn't you know the Vietnam period and what in just that kind of compartmentalization 
you know, hearing, I'm sure other people had different experiences, but um, it seems to be the common, uh, the common one for that. But it was interesting to hear all of that as well. And also, I've also always, um, I've seen, I've been around Frameline forever, and Bob's involvement, and seen him forever there, and I, I always, I didn't know him though, so I always perceived him as a pretty straight-laced guy. <laughs> and so, and it kind of buttoned down. And so it was interesting to hear uh, the, the more three-dimensional uh, parts. So thanks. I actually was surprised by some of that as well. And I know Bob, Bob <laughs> blames me for the fact that there's sex in this piece. Uh, but I think Alex can confirm <laughs> that Bob brought it up very willingly in the conversation. So. <laughs> that was not manipulated, and there's I mean, a lot on the I cutting room floor. Answering <laughs> questions. <laughs> um, this might be a place to give you the time check. So uh, one of the things, Loretta, that you just brought up was the Vietnam thing. In the process of trying to, to find a specific narrative storyline that I'm going to stick with to make these things work, which is specifically about the journey, uh, with two guys I really uh, deviated off of that path because there were significant pieces that I felt were really necessary. And with Bob, it was Vietnam. And with Daniel Maloney, who the piece is showing next week, who's African-American, uh, obviously race had to be a significant piece of the conversation too. Um, so that's also been an interesting, uh, both interviewing and editing balance to figure out, okay, where do we um, start veering off uh, the the main line and how does it reintegrate as we go on? Uh, I'm getting a little bit of waving that we're getting close to being finished, but yeah, I've been told to give the time check. We have to actually be out of the building. Um, the eight o'clock cutoff time is when the building is empty, so I think right. we need to wrap it up. Um, so should I just say thank you, Please. Alex? Thank you, Bob. <laughs> thank you all.